Hello, hello, welcome you all. It's a pleasure to be here with you people and welcome those who are watching us. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to be here all together today for the final episode of the series about Gabriel Delan and, and his work. So I welcome here to the studio, Charles Camp, Roberto Watanabe, Dana Sisi, Alexandre Caldini, Shane Martin, Faye Waddington, and Rafael Caldas. It's a great pleasure, great honor to be here with you guys today, all together. And unfortunately, um, we had four more speakers. They couldn't make it today. So um, it's going to be uh, just the eight of us. And what we are doing today, we are going to basically ask each one of the speakers to share with us their impression uh, about the work of the um, of the learn and you know the book more specifically that they uh, prepared and presented to us throughout the year so the first one here is uh, charles kemp so charles i hand it over to you <clears throat> thank you munir uh, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, I first would like to thank again uh, British Union of Spiritist Societies and Kardec Radio, as well as uh, the Spiritist Center for Peace for having taken this initiative and also all the presenters, huh, uh, the ones which are here and the one also who couldn't join, for uh, homenaging uh, Gabriel Delan. So Gabriel Delan is really together uh, with Leon Denis huh, uh, that we uh, uh, commemorated last year, huh, was really uh, the, the two strongest uh, followers of Alan Kardec, uh, who uh, along uh, their whole life stayed uh, very close, very, how to say, uh, they had a deep understanding uh, of uh, Kardec's work on the spiritist body of knowledge and spiritist philosophy. And they uh, really worked hard uh, their whole life. Uh, none of them uh, was married uh, in order to disseminate, to write books, to make lectures, to, to write, to make researches, uh, uh, to work also uh, for the spiritist uh, movements uh, uh, in, in this, uh, let's say, more or less 50 years after Kardec. So uh, both knew Alan Kardec, and Gabriel Delan in particular. Uh, he was born uh, one month or two months before the issue of the Spirit's book uh, in uh, 1857. And uh, he was uh, on the knees uh, as a little boy on the knees of Alan Kardec uh, when uh, he went with uh, his father and her mother, uh, his mother, who both were spiritists as well. Uh, during the weekends uh, in Villa Ségur in Paris, uh, uh, on the invitation of Kardec, uh, together with, uh, how to say, closest friends of Alan Kardec, and including uh, the young uh, Gabriel. And uh, Kardec was really very happy uh, with him. Huh? Uh, I have shown uh, how he started quite early uh, in the spiritist uh, exp experiments huh? uh, as a... a, a, a Teenager, he was already uh, giving some lessons and explaining how the tables are moving and whatsoever. And uh, uh, he was uh, really, uh, how to say, he had a quite a prolific uh, uh, career huh? because uh, he started uh, publishing the magazine Le Spiritisme. Huh? He was uh, leading it between 1883 and uh, 1891. Uh, uh, in the same uh, time, he wrote uh, his first book, uh, uh, Spiritist in Front of Science, the Spiritism devant la science. I was happy to see also the, uh, the presentation of uh, my colleagues here on the screen and the other ones about these uh, works, uh, uh, which I found uh, really excellent. Huh? Um, and uh, he, he was... Uh, how to say, a very meek person. He was strong in argumentation, huh? but he was very meek. I mean, uh, all the people liked him. He was really gathering a lot of people. Huh? He worked in the Union Spirit Française, huh? the first French federation 
who was uh, founded uh, in 1882, uh, still uh, before uh, the death of Amélie Boudet. And uh, uh, later on, he worked uh, with the Société Française pour l'étude des phénomènes psychiques, who was also, how to say, somehow making this uh, work for uh, gathering and joining uh, the different spiritist groups in France. Uh, he, he had really this uh, power, I would say, of agglutination, this power, uh, because everybody trusted in him. Uh, so <clears throat> I will not speak uh, too much about the works, uh, because I think uh, each one uh, of the presenters will do. Uh, I found really all the presentation excellent. Huh? Uh, I liked all them. I would say maybe a special uh, bravo to Raphael, uh, because he had uh, uh, the, the heaviest one, uh, two volumes, thousand, more than 1,300 pages, which is uh, encyclopedic uh, work uh, of Gabriel Delan about uh, uh, the, the, the materializations of living and of death. Huh? Uh, but I liked all the presentation. It was really uh, uh, very good. Uh, and uh, you are all, uh, how to say, congratulated for this work. Uh, just to finish, I would say uh, Gabriel Delan, he was uh, deeply convinced that Kardec was right. Huh? And uh, his work along his career was exactly to follow the progress of science. Huh? He was an engineer, so he, he could, uh, for, he had a more a scientific, uh, how to say, uh, approach. Huh? And uh, as soon as something new appeared in the science, he came and brought uh, this, showed how all this progress of science were consistent with the spiritist body of knowledge. Uh, yeah, at any moment, science proved that something was wrong in Kardec's assumption. So this is maybe a little bit the problem of the book of Gabriel Delan because he used scientific concepts from the eight of, end of the 19th and begins of the 20th century. And this concept of science have dramatically evolved in the century be, between uh, his last book and today. So some of the concept of science he's using are, how to say, uh, past or not in force anymore or have even been replaced by new ones. Huh? Nevertheless, I think, uh, his interpretation of uh, the spiritist phenomenon is extremely strong. I think uh, Humberto told uh, much more particular in some of, of the points uh, of, of the spiritist interpretation of Gabriel Delan and the arguments. And this is really what is uh, the, the, the most remarkable in his work. So I will stop here to leave also a field for my colleagues. Uh, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Charles. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, we've learned a lot with your uh, initial talk, your opening talk, you know, presenting um, or bringing to us the biography of uh, Gabriel Delan in details. It was very, very nice indeed. Thank you very much, Charles. So then we had in February, we had a talk by Alexandre Caldini about reincarnation. So we welcome you, Alexandre. Thank you, Munir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elsa. I'm sure she's she's watching us now. Thank you for the invitation. It was great pleasure and honor. And I learned a lot, studying a little bit about Gabriel Delaney with my own study and also watching uh, our colleagues here. So it's an honor and a pleasure again to be with you. Well, uh, what I try to do, Munir, friends, and whoever else is watching us is to summarize very briefly a bit well about this book, Reincarnation. It's a very, very interesting book. It was the last book that Gabriel Delan wrote. As a matter of fact, he didn't write. I learned that he was almost blind at that time. So he dictated the book, which is very interesting. See, what, what up to the point we, we take when we want to do something, he did take the whole book. Uh, the book was launched in 1924, just a couple of years before he passed away. <clears throat> and I, I did something interesting. I tried to see how was this period, uh, Charles, uh, since his birth in 1857, as you said, until uh, he launched the book, until the, la the last days of his last incarnation. 
And there was plenty happening during that time. It was a fantastic time. I wish I was there. Maybe I was there. Maybe we all were there. Uh, just a few notes. Darwin was launching his theory. Thomas Edison, Graham Bell, uh, Mr. Benz from, from the launch of the cars, invented the cars. Marconi with the radio. Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein. A lot of people, very intelligent, brilliant people at the same time. So everything was booming at that time. Uh, TV was invented, the viruses were discovered, the penicillin was invented. So it was a very, uh, how do you say in English, a very uh, profitable moment in history. At that time, he was also studying spiritism, which was also uh, starting to boom in Europe. This book, Reincarnation, the, the actual title of the book is, is very interesting. It's document, uh, sorry, Charles, about my French here. Document pour servir à l'étude de la réincarnation. So it's documents to understand the, the, the reincarnation. It's really a study. That's what Charles said is very much. It's very technical. He wants to prove things. In this case, he wants to prove reincarnation. And believe, friends, there's more than 100 cases on the book. So if, if uh, Rafael's book was this thick, mine was not so much, but there were so many things to, to see. There was, it's a bit tiring after a while, but the cases are so interesting, it's worth to see it. Basically, there's two ideas. There's many ideas, but two ideas that come through this book that I would like to highlight with you. One is about animals, animal souls, and the other one is what he calls integral memory or the memory retrieval, the recuperation of the memory. Concerning the animals, there's plenty of cases that he studies there about uh, telepathy between the tutors of dogs and, and the dogs themselves, and also horses that do mathematics. For me, there was a huge surprise, and I was a bit skeptical about it. How can a horse do mathematics, do a uh, high squadrada, I don't know how to say in English, square, square root. root? Square root, <laughs> right. Uh, but according to him, they, they did. And he, he describes the whole thing as how it was very well taken care of. For example, a, a, a blind uh, envelope with uh, the, response, the, the question inside, no one would knew the question before uh, it was told to the horse and the horse would make the calculation. There's one very peculiar thing that happened. He said, uh, the horse made the calculation and the, 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 the person, the human, made the calculation as well. And then the human said, no, 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 you're wrong. This is wrong. My result is so much. Your result is a different one. And the horse said, no, 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 you're wrong. My calculation is right. And, and the horse was right. So it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. For me, I'm still up today, uh, not, not really sure about that because it's so spectacular. And the dogs, they, he mentioned many other dogs' histories. One of the history uh, story. It's about the, the dog was, uh, the, 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 the tutor of the dog was not going to take her with him to a trip. And this guy, he lied to the dog. He said, no, no, I'm going to take you, etc." And the dog could smell, according to him, the lie. And he said, you're lying. Everything meant uh, mentally, right? So there's plenty there on, on animals. Basically, he says there is telepathic communication between animals. Uh, there's what he calls spirit sight, meaning that uh, both ways. Actually, dogs can see spirits and have some friends who, who, can, who, who had experience with that, their dogs. And spirits of animals can be seen as well by mediums, by, by psychics. Uh, he said that the animals have presentiments, can, can preview things that are going to happen. And obviously, he says they survive death and can be seen as well. So they have individualized the souls according to Gabriel Delaney. So the second point, the integral memory or a memory retrieval, basically what he says is the memory is not in the material, it's not on the brains. Memory is outside of the brain. And he tries to prove that. He does prove that with many, 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 many other studies. Uh, two of them I'd like to mention to you that particularly caught my attention. There was a, a, a lady, uh, she used to work in a house of very rich people. And she was the only one out, outside of the family working in the house. And some jewelry, just disappear, some rings, some necklace. And then uh, they start to say, what happened to the jewelry? And they start to, to, to interrogate her. And she said, I don't know, I have no idea. But you're the only one working here, but, but I have no idea. But listen, only you work here, etc. So to the point that she was put in jail, that she was in jail for a while, she was saying, I never took the jewelry, I never took the jewelry. Finally, after a few years, she was in jail. A guy comes to her as a medium and uh, through hypnosis, uh, she says the following, I know where the jewelry is. It's not on the, the same drawer. It's a different place inside the house. I took it from here and put it in another place. It's over there. So he says, 
that's a proof that the memory is outside of the, the, the body itself, because she could not remember that information until uh, she was under this medium, uh, mediumship, etc. Uh, there's other cases, I, I won't waste our time with that. But basically, he says about reincarnation as well, he says, Victor Hugo, Michelangelo, Mozart, all of them were at very young age, 4, 10, 12, 8, they were already geniuses uh, producing masterpieces. And he says, that's reincarnation. A person carries all the information, all the knowledge with him or her. And some of them are able to, to show that knowledge in very early ages. Yeah? He also says about uh, child prodigies, which is basically the same. He says, uh, child prodigies with very ignorant background, meaning mother and father are very ignorant from very poor people, had no access to education and were brilliant. He, he, he says Copernico was one of them. Uh, August Comte, Descartes, uh, Hegel, Locke, Kant, and many others. So he says, how could these people be so brilliant? Was their parents were not educated? They were not educating themselves. The only response is reincarnation. And he says the opposite as well, to the to the point that it's not a genetic thing, it's more a spiritual thing. He says, uh, very brilliant people like Socrates, Cicero, Marco Aurelius, Napoleon, Goethe, Louis XV, all of them have very dumb children, very non-brilliant children. So I said, it doesn't come with the, the genius. It's something that comes with uh, the, the, the reincarnation of the spirit. To summarize the whole thing, he says on the book, basically, he talks about palingenesis, which is that reincarnation has always been here since ever it's in Greece and everywhere else. It's not something that uh, spiritism have, uh, have uh, thought. Just a quote unquote here. Recently, I was making a speech and I tried to see which religions believe in reincarnation. Many, many to my surprise, including Jewish. I didn't know the Jews believe in reincarnation as well. There's a book about reincarnation, Jewish people, etc. Second point animals have transcendental faculties. Third, he says uh, we evolve through animal scale, meaning that we pass over all the animal scale until we become humans. Fourth, Integral memory, which I just explained, memory is not trapped in, into the brain, something outside of the brain. And the last point is, which is very important as well, not everything is spiritual. So be real careful what, how you interpret it. It was very scientific, right? Don't believe everything is a spiritual cause. Some things are just uh, things of life, right? I would like to, to end my, my comment here with a very brilliant sentence from Gabriel de Lani. I even put on, on the end of one presentation I made. Gabriel de Lange says, each one of us is, at all times, the making of oneself. I'll repeat, each one of us is, at all times, the making of oneself. I think that's beautiful. It shows autonomy. It shows that we are responsible for building ourselves in the best way we can. That was my brief speech about this book, Reincarnation, made in 1924 by Gabriel de Lange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandri. Yes, on top of all these points that you've uh, mentioned, you've highlighted here, the fact that, you know, at that age, with problems with his eyesight, he made the effort to write this wonderful book with the help of other people. He wrote so many books, he could have stopped, you know, there and said, no, I've, you know, I have already given my contribution, but he made the point, you know, of, you know, writing a book with all the, the physical deficiencies that he presented, you know, at, at that time, that that was something that amazed me a lot about about the land. Yeah. Munir, uh, I'm I'm basically not working. I basically retired. I have all the time I need. I'm writing three books. It's for three years. I'm writing three books. I never I never finish them. <laughs> <laughs> what a comparison! We know Thank how you. hard it is, but uh, yeah, not, not hard. It's just lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, and then in March. We had Roberto Watanabe. He talked to us about spiritism before science. And that was on the 5th of March. Roberto, I hand it over to you. Oh, it was mute. Thank, Thank you, Munir. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Glad to be here with you all. Uh, I would like to share my impressions about uh, Gabriel Delaney's life. I may repeat something that Charles has already mentioned, but anyway, 
Uh, I believe that Gabriel Dulan is one of the rare examples of those who at the Kardec's time had already been born uh, in a spirited family uh, because his father, like his father said, was, uh, well, I would say that he was one of Kardec's closest friends, right, Charles? And uh, Gab uh, Gabriel, like his father, he, uh, throughout his life, he was very faithful to the spirited postulates. I would say that he was more than even Leon Denis, who had a kind of a spiritualist uh, uh, bias, and uh, Flammarion, that uh, I think was too much a scientific uh, guy. But anyway, uh, his approach to spiritism, uh, like uh, Charles said, was more on the scientific aspect rather, rather than the philosophical or moral aspects probably because he was an engineer. And uh, I chose for my presentation his first book, Spiritism Before Science or Spiritism in Front of Science, like Charles said. I don't know if I, I, I make a, a correct translation. And in, in this book, he deals with some important uh, issues in the spiritism literature. At first, uh, he, he talks about the existence of the soul and the his arguments is against the materialists in this first part of the book. And second part, he talks about the magnetism and its relation, its close relationship with the, the spiritist uh, phenomenon, and of course, with the spiritism. And he talks about somnambulism, hypnotism, and which is, um, let's say, part of this magnetism issue. And the, the third part, he tries to, to, to prove the, the immortality of the soul. And then he goes back to the Hydesville phenomena in New, New York. Then he, he comes to Kardec's research in France. And after that, after that he, he covers um, William Crook's research on England. So that's all to, through all this research to prove the immortality of the soul. The fourth part of the book, he, he, he talks about the very spirit, which is that intermediary body that we have as a link between the soul and the physical body. And last part, fifth part of the book, he deals with um, mediumship, some, some types of mediumship only. So this was the first book and it was the beginning of a, a series of other very important books that my colleagues cover uh, throughout the year. And uh, all of them about the spirit, study of the spiritist phenomena. But I would, li I would like to, <clears throat> to mention here <clears throat> the book, Evol The Evolution of the Soul, which was presented by Vanessa. <clears throat> I think this is a very interesting book where um, Gabriel Delaney uh, bring a particular contribution from his part, because there he he bring to us, I would say, a fundamental basis to understand the evolution of the intelligent principle, because it's not only the evolution of the soul, the human soul, right? But he goes back to the animal kingdom, and uh, even to to the plants, to 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 the cells. So uh, it's a very interesting book. And uh, after uh, Kardec's death, uh, Gabriel Delaney, uh, he proceeded with, uh, with a leadership role in the spiritist movement, like uh, uh, Charles has already mentioned, uh, through, uh, through the French Spiritist Union or Federation, which was founded by his family. I believe his father was still alive at that time. And, uh, and uh, together with Leon Denis, um, Leon Denis came from, from Lyon just to, 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 to the foundation of the, this, this new organization and with the others, other friends. So uh, I would say that nowadays, um, the lens words are part of what we call, at least here in Brazil, we call the classics of the spiritism, which comprises all those works, those books, which were published between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So 
I'm talking about Denis, Delaney, Flammarion, Crooks, um, Bozano, um, all, all of these um, great research, right? And being a spiritist or a spiritualist, doesn't matter, right? Because all of them studied, studied the spiritist phenomena. So uh, that being said, I would like to thank you by this opportunity to participate in this wonderful program, which gives us the opportunity to study all these very important works, which is on the basis of the spiritist theory, I would say, theory and practice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you for your contribution, very important. And, and I remember being the first book uh, um, by Delan, the fact that he he mentioned so different aspects of spiritism and uh you know it was actually the beginning of the development that came after that you know talking yeah. about uh, you know in each chapter about one aspect and uh developing those aspects later on that that was um, very nice so it's very very interesting uh book thank you very much indeed thank you so in April, we had Rafa, uh, Flavio Zanetti. Uh, Flavio talked about uh, the spiritist phenomenon. Unfortunately, he sent me a message saying he, he wouldn't be able to join us today. But um, um, he, he you know, gave his contribution and we are very thankful for that. And then... We had Faye Waddington on the 14th of May talking about, uh, talking about researches about mediumship. So, Faye, would like to hear from you, your final impressions, and thank you very much for your contribution. Well, hello, and uh, I th it's my turn to thank you, and thank you all. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you all for, for accepting me. You know, it's an honor and a pleasure to be amongst you all, uh, specialists and teachers. Well, this um, uh, this book, um, a research about mediumship and friend and uh, Charles, excuse me, is a lot of research la vedinte. Anyway. Um, it was uh, a fascinating book, just like um, all the others. Um, and um, and what really, what, what caught me to start off was the preface. And, you know, and that is, if I had read just the preface, I'd be fine. I'd be happy. Because what he says is that he starts, he, but that book was published in, the year 1900 and being a, a, as an engineer being a scientist so um not only spiritist but one that kept a very um objective uh, take on everything um he felt he said that he felt that as a scientist and as a spiritist that um strives to confirm facts, um, he should be ready to accept evidence that proved him wrong. He wouldn't have any problem with that uh, as long as it proved him and proved the facts wrong. Fact against fact. And he started the, 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 the preface with the question, what is spiritism? And because the question was directed to scholars um, and um, everyone else that uh, had at that point, even after you know nearly 50 years after Kardec's first books, um, that uh, for, for, the, for the scholars and for the, the people in general, Spiritism was almost equivalent to superstition. And to the Catholic and Protestant clergy, it was a demonic practice. So that was the picture 
that he thought he had to deal with at the time. So um, he felt that as a scientist and knowing the science evolves, and especially at that time, the turn of the 19th century, that the science was uh, exploding with novelties and, and, and discoveries and all that, and all those geniuses working in every field of uh, human activity. He felt that it was perhaps time, uh, very respectfully, it was time to take Kardec's studies further and update them so as to remain scientific, you know, it's, uh, uh, and uh, because you would have evidence sent to him and observed and registered in many countries, just as Kardec did too. So he wanted to follow the same method uh, and and bring and and really take the risk and say, all right, if if we um, carry the investigation under the same scientific methodology today, is it going to confirm the original research? It did more than confirm; it expanded it. So, um, so he was um, out of his frustration to see spiritism misunderstood and and kind of limited to the dancing tables and uh, um, he had no doubt that he would find explanations that could be popularized, that could be uh, uh, spread out and um, change that perception of what spiritism really was. So this book, um, in particular, was uh, he, he took a bit of uh, uh, all that was that's being said so far, but he focused his. Um, he had well, it's a very broad spectrum of experience. So he, he so chose to focus this one on uh, um, on the mediumship. In general, your general study on, on mediumship, with an emphasis to the automatic writing of hysterics, or called hysterics at the time, it mean those people who were in turn in the mental institutions at the time called hysterics, and probably were there because of their manifestations of, of writing, mediumistic writing. Um, so he chose to study those and say what, at, to what extent, what he could see, and along with uh, most of the book, a number, a huge number of uh, um, cases that he describes in detail, how much that would be animism, how much of that would be automatic writing, and how much of that would be mechanical writing. And each of them, how did they, how were they characterized? What was the, the, the patient's experience behind it? And if they were not a patient, as it were just, a, um, uh, would that experience be translated um, beyond that the, the, the walls of the hospitals, um, they could be seen, uh, uh, because it could be noticed but at, uh, in a higher, let's say, a more educated levels of society. But then he saw that people with much less of any education would also um, present the same phenomenon of uh, mediumistic writing. He said, well, very well, I don't know, fair enough, very well, that Madame such and such would uh, uh, take uh, mediumistic messages in three, four languages, because she might have known some of the languages on her own experience of traveling of education. But what about the man who was absolutely illiterate and never left his corner of town and would still take messages in different languages? if he couldn't read his own. 
So um, the book was pretty much uh, um, a description, a detailed description of the dialogues in all the cases, or most of the cases that she studied that she found thought were the most relevant to bring absolute proof of um, the, of the mediumistic quality of those phenomena. And uh, shed a light in onto the, the way people were being treated as if they were demented when they were not. You know, they were being locked up in institutions when all they needed was guidance. And actually, they were being messengers rather than um, uh, people without any control of their own thoughts. So I thought this, this was really um, fascinating. And they say that that was it. So, well, these people are mediums, and what they do on this planet, on this surface, in our society, is to establish, is to help establish a communication between worlds, between dimensions. And um, I think this summarizes, I'm not going to give you any spoilers, <laughs> um, but I think this summarizes the, the, this wonderful, long, very detailed book, but still fascinating. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Faye. I remember you mentioning that you're really impressed by the introduction of the book. So yeah. <laughs> it was a good hook, you know. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> and uh, because I see today, uh, many of the scientists that we see in the media today repeating exactly the same principle. And one of them is that, look, we're not here to tell you that you're wrong. As scientists, we're not here to tell you that you're wrong. We're here to tell you what we find. And then you decide. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much, Faye. Thank you. <laughs> what I'm going to do now, because we have Dennis Easy and Shane Martin in a special condition, um, done his... Uh, on a cruise off the coast of Spain, so he may lose his internet. And um, Shane, she's under tornado alert. So uh, what we're going to do is just to allow you people here in the studio to, you know, talk, and then we go back to uh, the ones who sent us a video, you know, a short video as their contribution. So next one is. Uh, Rafael Caldas. In uh, July, he talked to us about the apparitions and materializations of living and dead. So, Rafael, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Munir. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, uh, of course, I'm going to have to say thank you very much for inviting me to, to this program and I have to say, Charles uh, did a brilliant job in the beginning. I remember watching Charles first uh, live, introducing us to the land, explaining you know, his biography and his life and so on. And it, it gave us a pretty good, I guess for me, a pretty good impression of what his personality was like. And his, when he describes him as a meek and friendly person and very um, rigid in terms of his scientific mind, but also uh, friendly. I, I could pretty much depict that when he was uh, describing. And I have to, I have to say, I have to confess that I've had heard of Delon before many times, but I was so far away from his work. I had never studied deeply. So I think this was such a great opportunity to just to understand a bit more about um, all of his contributions. And there is this, there is a this um, lecture online. Um, talking about Leon Denis and the, the lecturer is talking about um, when they started to do the, 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 the programs about Leon Denis and how important it is actually to study and talk about because you might end up 
uh, developing a new relationship on the other side that might be very useful, very strong, very important. So here I am hoping that um, one day I can go to the other side and say, hi, Dylan, remember me? I, I kept asking you to help me on that year. Um, anyways, fingers crossed. Um, but I also like that Alexandre mentioned uh, how Gabriel Dylan is an inspiration for his, again, the, the level of commitment and and delivery and just energy and it's 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 really inspiring i think that's that's the word right and i i did uh end up finding myself a situation saying you know what i need to just find it if anything within me remember remember what delaney did and how much he went through and how much he he, he helped us um and to charles point his the the the, 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 the books that i was uh, covering they are encyclopedias um, and but but he got me hooked from the from the beginning from the, just like Phil was describing in the question that he put in her preface, he got me hooked in the introduction as well because in the introduction he doesn't even start uh, you know trying to make you uh, be curious about what he's going to explore or not he comes and say look I have nothing new to add this is not the purpose of this um, this book the purpose of this book is to show you a catalog everything that has been studied, everything that has been discovered um, from a phenomenal perspective. He says that, and then he goes on to incite us with five big philosophers and their maxims about reflection. Reflect upon what you know. Reflect upon how you face things. Reflect upon what are the principles that are guiding your life, because you are so sure about some things. And that what got me hooked because in the preface he he made me think so much about okay but wait a minute you're right i have just so many things that I just take it for granted and so on. i don't even question it. i don't even i just it's just as a basic it's there and um i remember i brought one and i'm going to bring it back uh one of the the philosophers that he mentioned was uh one care i don't know if that's how i say his name and the the, the quote was uh, to doubt everything or to believe everything these are two equally convenient solutions, which one and the other exempt us from thinking. He was so clever in including starting this book with those philosophers, because he was pretty much about to uh, reveal, not reveal, but uh, tell us everything new that had been discovered that science could not uh, unveil that our traditional beliefs were not there, the religious beliefs were not there to, to account for. But everything was there. It had been investigated from a scientific perspective. Um, so that what got me hooked, I think, the, be the beginning of it. And then he went on to say, let me find it here, his, uh, his quote. For me, that was uh, one of the best ones. Um, he comes, of course, from a, from a scientific perspective, from a scientific um, point of view and he brings this sentence to the to his book as much as science is unassailable when it establishes facts it is miserably prone to error when it claims to establish negations that's how he he from a scientific perspective starts the book like first of all making us think and then says look Everything is based on science that it says it's not like it cannot be like this. It's not like that. That's when you that's when in a few years later or many years later, you, you find out that you are wrong. Um, anyways, the books that I was responsible for, he, he dedicated that to explaining everything that had been studied about phenomena. And he pretty much separated the book in two. One thinking about or exploring all of the aspects of phenomena related to the living. Um, so if not necessarily people were receiving messages or uh, seeing images or whatever there might be from somebody else that was uh, passed, but them themselves. They were being seen in different places at the same time, or they were able to communicate with one another uh, without uh, talking or writing or anything. He evaluated a lot of those uh, cases. He put this pretty much in a very nice package from, look, this is all the aspects that we have seen. This is 
all these are all these steps that were taken to to make sure that there was no tricks involved and so on then he goes to the second book and he talks about okay now we're going to look at the phenomena that another intelligence another mind is involved and the information that is brought through this phenomena is what proves us the information may be material aspects material elements that are produced or even ideas facts histories stories and so on um, anyways he goes through all of those categorize all of them and in the end it leaves it doesn't leave much room for um for question about three main things i think that's probably the uh, things that cross every single aspect of uh, spiritism which is immortality of the soul independence of the soul from the body and one of the things is probably the thing that we need to study the most which is perispirit the connection between the soul and the body and how that works and how that works um, a lot of the of his works um, or the, the cases that he brings they are quoted in many by many other authors uh, Kardec even mentions a lot of them. Interesting, uh, Kardec brings to some of the cases that he brought up and categorized, Kardec brings questions on top of them. To It goes back again to, I can't remember now who said it, that there's always an element of you don't accept things just because they're being told, but you investigate and you question and you ask uh, the right questions. And I think that's probably the thing that took the most from, from that specific work. It was very heavy in terms of content, but the uh, inquisitive investigative mindset that's what i took uh from from my time with the land that's how i call it um that's it um uh, just want to say thank you very much and i'll hand it over to whoever is next thank you Munir. thank you Rafael. yes i remember you did the brilliant job summarizing uh in a top two volume set yeah in within the time frame of a of one episode so yeah it was very nice thank you very much indeed uh, Rafael. so next is Dan Assisi he uh, talked about evidence for a future life that was in uh, October so then I hand it over to you thank you and I hope that you can hear me and see me okay Yes. Loud and clear. Yeah. Great. So wonderful. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's hard to add more to the wonderful insights that all the speakers have shared with before. And it was really great to also start with the overall um, approach of Charles. Thanks, Charles, again, for setting the setting the stage for us about Leon Denis, because he's such an interesting character. Um, my book uh, was published in 1899. It was called in French, and I'm going to beg Charles, um, you know, I'm going to hurt Char Charles' ears here, but uh, L'âme est immortelle, right? With the, the soul is immortal. And it was translated into English a little bit later on as evidence for a future life. So sometimes that already causes a little bit of confusion for those of us who are searching for his books. Um, but nevertheless, it's a fascinating book because... If you think, I think if I'm not mistaken, Charles, his first publication came in like 1885 and he continued to write until the 1920s. So you have a long span of action here, right? And in there, we see that uh, this is somewhere in the middle. And this, this book is a fascinating book for me. And I think in many different ways, it speaks to the mind that Delan brings to the mix because of the way it's organized. And this is something that seems to be true with everything that he does. Um, I, for one, am one who really likes to look at the table of contents of books because it tells me not only what I'm gonna get into, but how the author taught to organize the, the subject matter at hand. And in this particular book, which as you can guess, deals again with the evidence for a future life. What is the scientific evidence present at the time that pointed to a term that we now use, uh, the survivability of the soul, right? That the soul can outlive the physical body. And if we just look at the table of contents, for instance, we're gonna find that he divides this book into three different parts. The first part is really about observation. He talks to us about the theory, he shares with us that there are ancient beliefs 
about life after life. He talks about different cultures, what they believed in. Um, he then shifts into the study of the soul uh, by what they call the means of magnetism, which again, it's not the magnetism as we know today. It's also important to have a little bit of historical context of the time as uh, Alexander also shared with us to understand that we were talking about uh, a magnet, mag magnetic approach to things with Mesmer at the time. So he shares a little bit about that with us um, and then talks about uh, this physical body that we have and this spiritual body and, and how they can manifest themselves. And in part two of this book, he shifts from observation to experience. And then this is where he starts, he starts talking about all the different experiments that were out there. Um, in English, you're going to find the term the double, which is the manifestation of the spiritual. Um, you know, we can basically sometimes call that um, the pair spirit as well. And he shares with us a little bit more about the experiments of Mr. De Horsha and, and Dr. Louise as well. Also researchers at the time that um, are well known and stood on their own in terms of the kind of psychic research that they did. He also talks about spirit photography and he dives into a little bit into the evidence that was there. But what I think it's, you know, was mentioned here before and also fascinating is that he brings it all back together in part three, which he calls Spiritism and Science. And he goes again to this idea of the study of the pair spirit or, or the spiritual body that we have. Um, he talks about space, time, uh, matter. He talks about the spiritual plane and energy. And he wraps up with some extra considerations on um, how materialization can take place and how, um, you know, the phenomenon of the double can take place being into different places as well. So in short, I think what I really appreciate about Delan's work is that his is a very thoughtful approach to what is it that he is studying and what he's bringing forth to us. It's if we know that he was a spiritist from a young age, we could very well say that, you know, he had already been convinced that spiritism was a solid body of knowledge and a, a reliable field of, of understanding that would help him get the answers that he needed. But yet he decided to go and look at the scientific evidence to see if it matched that which he believed and had been told by his father and, of course, by Alan Kardec. And I find that that's admirable, right? Because nowadays, many of us sometimes just read something and we just accept it and move on. But he was keen to look at the validation from outside what he knew. And I think that is the underlying beauty of spiritism is this idea that we have so much that we can connect to, right? Our body of knowledge is so vast and that it keeps growing. It started with Kardec, but it did not end with Kardec, that he continues to grow and expand. And it's because of people like Delan, of course, like Flammarion, and of course, like Denis, and many others that came before that added to it by looking at the world outside and saying, hey, this connects with what we're talking here, or hey, this can add to what we're talking here, or it can better illustrate what we're talking here. And I think that is a beautiful thing, not only uh, on the lens part, but spiritism in general, that we can see the world and connect to what's outside and not just say, no, 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 we're not going to go outside our five basic books that were brought by Kardec. There's no truth outside of that, right? We don't, we don't make those affirmations. We are keen to look outside and see how can we see validation from that which we have understood? How does that match the physical world? And how can we draw a bridge to the spiritual world? And how can we make adjustments or add uh, like layer upon layer about what we know to continue to grow this beautiful body of knowledge? So I really appreciate Delan's thoughtfulness, uh, thoughtfulness and approach to science at the time as it was um, to try to connect those bridges and actually leads us to quite a bit of a study into the pair spirit, which is such a key um, element of our um, scientific understanding of the world in general when we see it through the spiritist lens, right? So um, I, I, I'm really touched by the amount of information he was able to gather. Um, he was able to organize in a way that we can understand and put forth in a way that we could um, cognate and really make sense of things. Now, I know that we oftentimes talk about spiritism being a conjunction of things, being part, you know, moral and ethical, part scientific, 
and part religious or philosophical in many different ways as well. Um, and we, we can very much understand that Delan definitely leans a little bit to the scientific, but nevertheless, it's a great effort for us to, even if we don't feel as scientific as we would like, to make an effort to understand what connections are there into the world. So Delan took me on this wonderful trip um, to go back in time and understand that the challenges that he was trying to connect the dots for are the same challenges that we're still do today with science, right? Uh, at, to this day, if you swap a couple of words that he used, a couple of terms, you see that on the whole, what he was trying to do is much the same that many other people are trying to do today, which is to kind of show that the survivability of the soul is in fact true. And, and once we arrive at that point, of course, there's great moral implications and ethical considerations. But nevertheless, that work is very important, even if we have already accepted that is true. So I love to see the land's work because it adds so much to us, even if we are, you know, a um, hundred years later, right? Because I think in two two years or so, if I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken here, we're going to celebrate the 100th um, year of his discarnation. Uh, but even a hundred years later, the idea and the concept of his research and what the message he wanted to pass to us, even, even if some details might have evolved, remains the same. And I think that's also the beauty of spiritism, that it's always growing, it's always evolving. So um, here's to Delan, here's to all of you who put forth time to, to think about this incredible figure that adds to the pantheon of the great thinkers that made spiritism what it is today. And also in that same spirit, we're excited to share that we are taking this book, Evidence for a Future Life, that sometimes is hard to find in print. And we are going to uh, publish that again in print for folks who want to buy that. So hopefully that will be a step in making it, uh, the land more accessible, not only to us on the internet via PDFs and you know, digital files, but those who like me still like to hold a paper book a little bit. So we have a new version coming up um, of, of the translation that was done by H.A. Dallas uh, you know, in the, in the previous century in this coming year. But you know, I'm gonna stop babbling here because I think, I think the, the message here that that I bring is one of gratitude for his very methodical, very wise and very considered approach in coming with all the different information out there and making it accessible and cogent for us to understand that the science that it's out there in no way, shape or form uh, goes against what spiritism tells us. In fact, it's complementary. They are complementary to each other as they should be. Because if one thing is true, then we should find a perfect alignment between the ethics, the science, and the philosophy towards that which it, which is. Right? So very exciting to to have the land on the forefront. And thanks for the opportunity to be here with you. And hopefully my internet did not cut along the way and I made halfway sense to you. But thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Dan. It's always a pleasure to listen to what you have to say. And I remember the way you... You summarized the book and presented it to us. It's, it's very nice indeed. Thank you for your contribution, your time. You know, you know, it, it's uh, it's it's precious, and uh, we are very thankful for that. So then we had in November, Dr. Shane Martin. She talked about pioneer science of reincarnation. So, Shane, I hand it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Muni. Thank you, Buzz, Elsa, and all of the mentors of all of the places, all of us, the co-hosts of this program. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and also a very humbling experience. As all, I think, Rafael mentioned, we are sometimes doing the contemporary work of spreading spiritism without knowing what came before us. So this topic of being a pioneer of science of reincarnation kind of forced me to go back and look at what was done before. So there's this touchstone that Kardec and uh, his contemporaries worked so hard for us to be here today. And mainly I focus on not only I had to go back to Charles' presentation, thank you Charles for the wealth of knowledge and all of the work that you do uh, to keep alive this history for us, of bringing to us who that Gabriel Delon was in, as a reincarnated being at the time, because it's important to know where he came from, to know how he got to develop the commitment he had uh, to 
to the cause and the amount of work he was able to produce with the resources that he had at that time, right? We all could use a little bit more of that efficiency and dedication in our own lives as well. But mainly I focus on showing to the viewer his method uh, methodical approach to spiritism. So he was able to show in a very scientific manner of science of the time, but still with the hints of the scientific method that we use today, you know, the, the focus on the data, the description of the, his bibliography, his quotes, everything was documented. He showed what came before him with a reduction or very focused on the reduction of bias. So he was not just cherry picking things from spiritism or people like him, but he was able to bring many different um, fields of, this, of the time to make a case for um, reincarnation being a fact that in a time, as you mentioned, with all this uh, plethora of scientific discoveries and changes that they had, he showed the arguments, the pros of each example he gave. Alexandre Caldini mentioned the book Reincarnation has over 100 cases. And this very academic style, bibliography, he says arguments, pros, cons, implications of what he was presenting to us, the conclusions he made, with always a scientific approach of able to change his mind, as Faye mentioned. You know, he was able to say, if you present me with the data that would change my uh, conclusions, I will go with it. And that's what we all do as here, and some of us still work on the scientific um, aspect of academia. If someone proves us wrong, we have to be humble enough to say, okay, you have better evidence than I did. And the methods change. Um, we are almost like doing reincarnations under reincarnations or what they describe in physics before is not what we have here, biology, medicine. So we're always evolving and we need to understand what he did because I feel like this book is so important for us as a society when we are cherry picking what we want to believe in. Delaney brings us back to, no, you have to look at many different fields, many different points of view and come up with a conclusion. But in, in synthesis, it was very humbling to see the amount of work he was able to do and uh, be able to learn with each and every one of you and thanking you for your time that we all put time and effort into presenting um, this so that the viewer from Kardec Radio can have a little bit because we don't have time in an hour to show all the work, but it, it plants that seed within us to be able to say, do how do we spend our time and what kind of um, studies can we all do when we look back and, and thank and honor those who came before us as well. So I thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to many, uh, many more of these collaborations to help us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. I remember mentioning to you, we discussed at the end of your talk, that uh, Delan, he was actually a man analyzing the phenomena, not so much the theory itself, but actually collecting data to analyze them and show, you know, what, what we could learn from them. And uh, that, that was, you know, major, in my view, his, one of his major contributions was actually to look at the phenomenon, analyze and collect data. And uh, that, that was very important since the theory you had from Kardec, theory in, in, in inverted commas, but you know, the, the um, fundamentals of uh, spiritism we had from Kardec's books. And then he added on top of that, the, uh, you know, the, the data he collected and analyzed. That, that was very good. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Elsa here with us. Hello, Elsa. Very nice that you are here because all this wouldn't be possible without Elsa. She was the one behind all these inviting people and, you know, preparing the topics. And so we are very grateful for her work that was, you know, behind the curtains. But without her help, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you, Munir. Thank you all. It's grateful to see everyone here contributing for try, uh, bringing the pioneers to the light, the, the other hearts, our English speaker people listening 
and knowing a little bit more about Leon Denis, Gabriel Delany, and now Camille Flammarion, 2024. So thank you all for seeing yes. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Although I am late, because I was crossing the sea mountains, Serra do Mar, <laughs> working yesterday and today in a small town talking about spiritism and Chico Xavier. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you, my friends. Thank you to our <laughs> audience. And thank you, Munir, for being a nice and wonderful host. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. We have two videos to show, one from Vanessa Anceloni and another one from Carolina Correa. So in uh, June, uh, Dr. Vanessa Anceloni, she talked to us about the evolution of the soul. So she was very kind and sent us a short video. So I'll show the video here. Hello, dear friends. It's a joy to be reunited with like-minded minds. First of all, I'd like to spend these few minutes in gratitude to the British Union of Spirit Societies for this initiative. I have personally learned much with my colleagues and with the study that I was given, assigned, about the evolution of the soul. Gabriel Delan is certainly one of the most important pioneers in spiritism after Kardec and Leon Denis. I learned much with him, first about his honesty, about how honest and coherent he was in his life, dedicating and devoting himself to the dissemination of spiritism. He wasn't afraid to expose himself at a time in which people could barely understand it. The times have changed. We have much more freedom of expression. And Gabriel Delany not only believed in it, knew of it, not only professed it in his own spirit center, but he went even further. He published his books very deep, bringing the triple aspect of spiritism, which is all about the philosophical component, the scientific one, and the moral, ethical, moral implications. Amongst them, when we talk about the evolution of the soul, he says that we evolve and never regress. That for us is striking to confirm and reaffirm the revelation brought at Kardec's time as we read in the Spirit's book by Kardec. In the book Evolution of the Soul, Anemic Evolution, he is Preparing the grounds between Kardec, Chico Xavier, and Andre Lewis. When Andre Lewis comes and talks in depth about our evolution into worlds. So, of all things that he said and wrote and that I studied, I would like to highlight the fact that we progress and never regress. Since Jesus said once to Nicodemus, as reported in the book Good News, in the New Testament, and then later more explained in the book Good News by Umberto de Campos through Chico Xavier, it's not enough to know. We have to feel it. If we know these teachings, and they do not change our lives. If we keep on our torments and disturbances in envy, jealousy, competition, and we do not construct true feelings, we're going to reincarnate many times, as he explains, to finally do it. I think this reincarnation is the most special for us. Let's build the best feelings. After all, we are all progressing. I want to thank you 
for the time that we have been together and for the team of all the speakers and the coordinators at the British Union of Spirit Societies for putting together such a beautiful initiative, one that deepens our knowledge of the science of the spirits. We hope to see you soon into 2024. Thank you, friends. So thank you very much, Vanessa. It's been a great pleasure to listen to her presentation. And then we had Dr. Umberto Schubert Coelho. That was in August. He talked about documented evidence for the study of reincarnation. Unfortunately, he was called at work in the last minute and he sent his uh, regards to everyone and apologies for not being able to join us today. And then we had Dr. Carolina Correa in September, and she talked about the immortal soul. She also sent us a short video, which I'm going to show now. Hello, dear friends. We are delighted to join forces in this beautiful teamwork effort of the good to once again pay tribute to our dear Gabrielle Delun. Gabrielle Delun was a spirit much ahead of his time, reincarnated at the time of Kardec. He was a visionary. Without hesitation, beloved friends, he decided to devote his time and effort and resources to spread the truth, the light of the truth, in a time where not everyone on earth was prepared to receive the truth from on high. Gabriel Delun embraced the truth in the form of God's loss so beautifully that aligned with Kardec, he decided to write, do research, and write about the immortality of the soul, providing evidence from many angles of the afterlife still in the 19th century. What a beautiful Christ conscious spirit, dear friends. So the example left to us by Gabriel Delun begs the question, number one, do we accept the truth in the form of God's laws as he has done and number two, do we ourselves in our very own circle of action have the courage as he did and still does to spread the light of the truth for the collective good? Good questions, dear friends, for us to meditate upon so that we become multipliers of the good as well. Gabriel Delun was such a brilliant mind that he carried out a very comprehensive study of the immortal soul. He provided in his book a historical overview showing proof of the immortality of the soul and further enhancing the universality of the spiritist teachings to which Kardec already made reference. He provided a study of the soul through magnetism, testimonies in favor of the existence of the perispirit. He carried out a study on spirit detachment and many more. So we owe a great deal of gratitude to 
um, Gabriel de Lund because as Master Jesus told Bartolomeu in the book Good News, the characteristics of a follower of the Christ, someone who is already aware of the Christ consciousness and allows the governance of the earth to guide them, are joy, courage, and hope. And Gabriel Delon most certainly had the courage and the vision to embrace God's beautiful laws and showcase, share the truth, the light of the truth with you and I as an act of pure love for him as it is for us through our spiritist understanding of life, the immortality of the soul is a result of God's loss of love for no one is forsaken and everyone has the opportunity to renew themselves and to begin anew, to progress always. So we leave you beloved friends with this beautiful message of encouragement, joy, and hope embodied by our dear Gabrielle Delon. Thank you, dear friends, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Well, these uh, were the talks we had during 2023. But then for those who are already feeling sad at the year, it's, you know, ending and uh, this is the last gathering as i would say uh you know regarding uh, gabriel delan i have a piece of good news for you we already have a new project for next year it's going to be camille from our own series so we'll do the same as we did during 2023 we'll be having the first sunday every sunday first sunday of the month we have someone talking about um, camille from Arion and his work and we already have charles talking to us that is going to be on the 7th of january same time 7 p.m uh camille from our own biography in uh, the school it conducts them. So, good news for next year. And you're all invited to join us in this project. I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. So, my dear people, the only thing that I have to do now is to thank you once again, very much indeed. Hope you can be with us next year for this new project. And wish you all a very happy Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank See you, you next year. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Pleasure Thank to be you. with you all. Thank, Thank you all. all. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Feliz Natal. Feliz Natal. Happy holidays. Yeah. Happy holidays. Yeah.